Our call to worship this evening uh, is from the sixth chapter of the book of Isaiah. In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds trembled at the voice of him who called out while the temple was filling with smoke. And then I said, Woe is me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongs. He touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is forgiven. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. Let's pray together. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are the holy, holy, holy God. And we come into your presence, mindful of your goodness, your glory, and your splendor, and we tremble, and yet we are reminded of one who lived the life for us, the life we failed to live, and died the death that we deserve to die on the cross. The Lord Jesus Christ, the holy God, become fully man, so that we might be forgiven of our sins, so that we might be reconciled to you, so that we might gather in your presence tonight, not out of fear that you might wipe us out, but with humble rejoicing that the great and glorious God has drawn near to us and we are his beloved. Father, what a joy and a privilege it is to gather in your presence to worship you this evening. Would you fill our hearts with wonder and our mouths with praise? Receive this worship as we offer it to you in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Uh, for our guests, my name is TJ Campo. I'm the senior pastor here at St. Andrews, and uh, it's just been a pleasure to work with George and so grateful for this particular moment in his life. Uh, the presbytery has made me what's called the presiding minister at this uh, situation. Boy, were they stupid. No, uh, no. Um, so I have to just kind of walk you through the process and, and let you know what uh, has gone into uh, George's preparation up to this point. Um, George had to have an undergraduate degree, then a graduate degree in theology. Uh, his degree was in engineering, and then he went on his own and got a master's degree in theology, and then came to the presbytery. He had a couple more classes to bulk up, so while he's been working here full time, He's been taking courses on the side as well and uh, measured up to the presbyteries, what they call the trials of ordination. And then they, uh, they put him through more trials by putting him under an internship with me. And then uh, he made it through that, okay, and uh, came under what we call the undercare process with the presbytery. And they were overseeing this every step of the way. And then George had more trials to undergo in that he had to uh, have a written exam that took about uh, over 12 hours total to do all the five parts in that exam. And then he had to come before the committee to be examined on all the separate parts of the written exam orally. And then they held him underwater to see if he would drown. No, 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 sorry. That was, no, that's the witch trial, sorry. Uh, 
after that, they, uh, he passed the, all those exams and had to stand before a presbytery to see if there were any follow-up questions. And uh, after he was passed through that, they uh, set a day for his ordination. But of course, God ordained Irma instead on that day. And uh, today is, is that day, October 1st, a day that will live in infamy in, uh, here at St. Andrews and George's life. I want to introduce uh, the commissioners of the Presbytery. They uh, are here representing the Presbytery. And uh, so if I could just ask them to stand, you who are members of the, of the commission. And uh, the ruling elders as well. Uh, this is Charles Kelsey on, on my right and your left. And uh, Norm Box in the back. Uh, he, there are elders here at St. Andrews. Uh, David King is in the back. Over here is John Homus. John is a teaching elder in the Presbyterian Church in America. Uh, is uh, officially on staff here at St. Andrews, but he's really the church planter of our sister uh, congregation, New City Fellowship, uh, on the border of Hollywood and Hallandale. Next to him is John Stevenson. John is a teaching elder in the PCA and uh, has his credentials here at St. Andrews. He's a, a professor at, at uh, two local colleges of theology and the Bible. And next to him is Warren Gage. Uh, Warren Gage is uh, no stranger to St. Andrews. We uh, love him dearly. He's a teaching elder also with the Presbyterian Church in America and uh, works with Alexandrian Forum. You can be seated. We're grateful to have you guys. Now, um, I have the great privilege of telling you the good news. So let me pray for us, and then I'm going to read this passage on uh, chap page four in your bulletin. Let's pray. Lord, bless now the reading of your holy word, and we ask that you would bring grace and truth to bear on our lives. Plant the seed of your holy and powerful word in our hearts. Inspire faith in us so that we receive these words and they bear good fruit for your glory, for our good, and for the good of the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Listen now as I read 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 4, the whole of the chapter. Therefore, since we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we do not lose heart. But we have renounced the things hidden because of shame, not walking in craftiness or adulterating the word of God, but by the manifestation of truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus as Lord, and ourselves as your bondservants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, light shall shine out of darkness, is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels so that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not from ourselves. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not despairing, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying about in the body the dying of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. For we who live are constantly being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So, death works in us, but life in you. But having the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believed, therefore I spoke, we also believe, therefore we also speak, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and will present us with you. For all things are for your sakes, so that the grace which is spreading to more and more people may cause the giving of thanks to abound to the glory of God. Therefore, we do not lose heart, but though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. 
while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. The word of the Lord. Uh, The passage I just read is a part of a defense. Uh, There's there's a minister who uh, has a congregation turn against him, which can happen. George, are you sure you want to go through with this? (laughs) And, uh, And that's the case here. A congregation has turned against the minister. The congregation at Corinth has turned against the Apostle Paul, and Paul is having to make a defense of his own ministry. Uh, There are opponents, some in the church, some outside the church, and in the midst of this specific discussion, Paul presents a kind of view of or approach to the spiritual life, as if to say, this is how true spirituality works. This is what the gospel produces. So let's look at it tonight under three headings. How does the spiritual life work according to the gospel? Uh, What is true spirituality and its outworking, and how does it play out in our lives? Number one, regeneration, a new genesis. Number two, representation, the cruciform life, and I'll explain that in a moment. And number three, renewal, encouragement in the light of God's strength, and our weakness, Represent, or re- regeneration, representation, and renewal. Uh, Paul has been getting grief from people, and um, they have him up against the ropes, especially from traditional religious people. They've kind of turned against Paul, especially from his own people, from conservative Jewish people. And um, they don't mind these conservative Jewish people, they don't mind Paul teaching the Bible to Gentile people. What could it hurt? But they prefer, if he's going to teach the Bible to Gentile people, that Paul would concentrate on the most important part of the Bible, which are the laws of Moses. Because if the Gentiles can only get the laws of Moses, maybe the Gentiles can stop being so Gentile-ish. Maybe they can start to shape up. And, and Paul is saying, I don't mind teaching about Moses, as long as you know, conservative Jewish friends of mine, that Moses came to condemn us. Moses came with the law of God, so we could see how far short we fall of God's standard. The 613 laws of the, of the Torah scream to us, that despite what we might think about ourselves, we do not love God as we should. We do not love other people as we should. And it's really important to know that. It's really important that every person have a correct diagnosis of his or her spiritual condition. So Moses did us a great service. And Paul is saying, and I'm into that, totally convinced by Moses that we're not good, that we're diagnosed as being in desperate need of forgiveness and restoration. I think, says Paul, Moses is therefore super the great diagnostician of the Bible. And when you have something wrong, but you don't know what it is, you need a really good diagnostician, and there's none better than Moses. But, says Paul, Moses and his laws really aren't the core of the Bible. That would be the promises of God. And the Old Testament is promising a Savior who would save us, who had been diagnosed with that terminal spiritual disease called sin. And the Old Testament is promising someone who could cure us, a Savior. And if Moses was great and glorious, and he is, how much more glorious and great is the one who is promised to save us, who accomplishes the law? Moses diagnosed it but there's one coming who will fulfill it. Imagine um, you're on, at an outdoor stage. It's like an amphitheater. And imagine it is so black that you literally cannot see 
the hand in front of your face, completely pitch black. You have zero visibility at all. And someone, unbeknownst to you, walks out onto the stage. It's Moses. And he lights a candle. And all of a sudden, you can see all the characters on the stage and even the characters in the audience are desperately sick and dying. And there's Moses with this little light of mine, you know? He's got a light, and everyone is diagnosed as sick and dying. And then, behind Moses with this little light of mine, the sun comes up from behind the stage, and the light of that little candle is completely enveloped. So Jesus Christ outglories Moses like the sun outshines a candle. And that's why Paul insists, to the dismay of his Jewish friends, look, I'll talk about Moses, but I can't put Moses at the center. That place belongs only to Jesus Christ, the Son of Righteousness, who rises with healing in his wings, who saves us from the guilt that we incurred by breaking the law that Moses diagnosed us to break. Jesus Christ is the healer. And when we get that, when you see your own failings that are way bigger than you thought, and when you see that Jesus Christ came into the world to obey Moses for you, to fulfill the law's demands, and to die under the penalty of the law as a lawbreaker, when you get that, if you get that, it's like a new creation in your life. It's like the God who spoke light into existence, the God who said, let there be light. It's like he shines that primordial light into your soul. For God who said, light shall shine out of darkness is the one who has shown into our hearts and given us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. It's a regeneration. A new genesis takes place. In the next chapter, Paul will use the same terminology. He'll say, if anyone is in Christ... He is a new creation. In other words, this person in Christ has been made a member of Universe 2.0, a new creation that's coming. And everyone in Christ is welcomed into this new creation. He begins to see not that he's suddenly sinless, this person who has made a new creation, not that he's suddenly fixed in every facet of his life, but he begins to see the main thing about existence, the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. And this regenerated person, part of the new order that God will bring about, sees that God is revealed in the human face of Jesus Christ. The most complete unveiling of God's glory and mercy is in this person, Jesus Christ, the image of God, the God-man. A creative act takes place, and God speaks light into the soul, and that soul sees and believes, comes to life, and sees the meaning of it all, though in a small way. Now, what this means is, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, it's because God has turned a light on in your soul. Charles Wesley wrote the words that you who really love old hymns perhaps know. Thine eye diffused a quickening ray. I woke the dungeon filled with light. God sent light into my soul and I came to life quickened. I was regenerated. I believed. And that's how the spiritual life begins and how it works. It starts by regeneration new creation. And this new genesis, God speaking light into the soul, stays focused on the source of that light in Jesus Christ. It starts with him and it moves in his direction. That soul who believes begins to see little by little, ah, he represented me. He stood in my place. He obeyed God's law on my behalf. He obeyed, I get the credit. It's like Usain Bolt. Just want to send some love to my Jamaican friends tonight. It's like Usain Bolt wins the 100 the meter dash and you get put on the podium for the gold medal. 
It's like Jesus Christ lives the perfect life and you get rewarded in his place. In this new creation, Jesus Christ, the image of God, is the new Adam representing a new people who acts on our behalf. And as he stood in my place, he now designs for me, so to speak, to stand in his place. In other words, I get his status attributed to me. The great exchange takes place. He gets counted a criminal. He gets my identity. And I get counted a son. I get his identity. God sees me now represented by Jesus Christ as if I myself were perfectly obedient. He, the firstborn of the dead, the progenitor of a new humanity, the start of the new creation, stands in my place. And all this that is his is now mine because he represented me. And by the mysterious working of his power, God goes to work little by little making me in practice like my representative. The last chapter ends with these words, but we all with unveiled face beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. In other words, God not only forgives us and takes away the guilt of sin, but as it says in Rock of Ages, also takes away the power of sin little by little. I'm being transformed. I may not look very much transformed to you, but little by little, I am being transformed. I am even now becoming what I am declared by God to be and destined to God by God to be. I am becoming that. Declared a delightful son, and I'm being transformed to look, act, think, and speak like the son I have been declared to be. I'm becoming like the one who represented me, and he is making me fit to represent him in the world. And that's why Paul would say, for we who live are constantly being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our mortal flesh. In other words, just to bring this right down to where you're living, wherever God has placed you, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, God has placed you there in order that he might be represented by you in that calling or place. We are called the church, the believers in Jesus Christ. We're called the body of Christ. We are an extension of Jesus Christ in the world. He's moving us in the direction of what I call the cruciform life. Do you know that word cruciform? Uh, we have a church in Hollywood called the cruciform church. Cruciform, we think of cathedrals as being cruciform. If you could see the cathedral from an overhead shot, the cathedral is built in the shape of the cross. And God is working in us the cruciform life, the life that is conforming to the person and work of Jesus Christ. He's moving us in the cross-shaped life. Not that Paul's going to die for our sins. Not that you're going to die for anyone's sins. But Paul will say some of the most outlandish things about how Christians are being brought into this cruciform life our mode of existence in the here and now. God is replicating the dying and rising of Jesus in our lives as we go work on yachts, as we are an accountant, our scientists, our woodworkers, our homemakers, wherever our calling is, God will replicate the dying and rising of Jesus in those places through those who believe. Think of what Paul says, for instance, in Romans 8, 36. For thy sake, God's sake, we are being put to death all day long. We are considered as sheep led to the slaughter. Colossians 1, 24. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and I do, and in my flesh I do my share on behalf of his body, which is the church, filling up that which is lacking in Christ's affliction. And here, verses 10 and 11, always caring about in the body the dying of Jesus, 
in order that the life of Jesus might be manifest in our body. For we who live are constantly being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus might also be manifested in our mortal bodies. This pertains to all believers, but especially to those who are ministers in the church. He represents me so that I might represent him. God has placed us in the world that by the doing and dying of Jesus, that story would continue to echo and refract through us billions of times like mirrors. He has placed us in specific situations as he wills so that the good news might be represented in those places. And not only announced, but embodied in persons who are answering callings in all these different areas. God has purposed that, like Jesus Christ, whom we represent in the world, that our lives would be lived for the spiritual benefit of others. We live dying to ourselves, and as we do, the resurrection life of Jesus is demonstrated. When Paul thought of this role that we're given in the world, he asked in verse 2, In chapter 2, who is adequate for these things? Who could possibly represent Jesus Christ to his or her children, to his or her workplace? And Paul answers, who is adequate for this calling? Our adequacy is from God. And I have to ask myself, you have to ask yourself, whatever calling you're going to answer tomorrow, whatever your Monday morning looks like, wherever you go to work out your calling in the world, You have to ask, really? Is this really what I signed up for when I started the Christian life, that I would be caring about the dying of Jesus so that the life of Jesus might be manifested in my body to those who are looking on? Well, like it or not. You know, you might not have thought that's what the Christian life was when you signed on, but that's exactly what the Christian life is. God will move us in that direction. And the good news is, is that all along the way, as we are seeking to, having been represented by Jesus, now seeking to represent Jesus, all along the way, God is renewing us. I don't know if you noticed, but in this long passage that I just read, there's not a single thing for you to do. Not a single imperative command word in that whole passage. God is doing the work and doing the work in us. Paul doesn't even say, and in light of these things, don't lose heart. Instead, he says, therefore, we do not lose heart. And all of this is to emphasize that it is God's doing. God will use our weakness to emphasize his strength and glory. We have this treasure in clay pots to show that the surpassing greatness of the power is from God and not ourselves. God's light shines through the cracks in our cracked pots. George is a cracked pot. In fact, we all are. If the light of God is in us, God's strength shines out through our weakness. And when our weakness is exposed, and when it becomes evident to those around us, that we in ourselves don't have the right stuff. And when the stuff that we want to hide and keep secret from ourselves, from God, from from other people, when that sort of shows the cracks in the pot, God says you don't have to be afraid of that stuff. You don't have to be afraid of your clayness. The weakness And the stuff that's discouraging, I will use that to keep you resting and depending on me. Therefore, says Paul, we do not lose heart. But though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day, for momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. It's so unnatural for you because we we crave control and we want to be strong in and independent 
But God is saying that is not the way to become what I have destined you to be. Be weak in yourself, and I will be strong in you. You know, at the start of the letter, Paul recounts one particular leg of his journey where he himself and all of his companions got so discouraged they were literally on the verge of suicide. For we do not want you to be unaware, brethren, of the troubles which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened excessively beyond our strength so that we despaired even of life. And at the end of the letter, Paul returns to it and says, Christ has said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is perfected in your weakness. Most gladly, therefore, says Paul, I will boast about my weaknesses, that the power of Christ may dwell in me. You know, it would be great if you went to work tomorrow and boasted about your weakness to your coworkers. It would just be great to do that because then as you expose your cracks, the light in the clay pot can begin to shine out. Have you heard people say, God will never give you more than you can bear? Have you heard that? Look, according to Paul, God will always give you more than you can bear. Because that's the only way that we will stop making this about ourselves. And the only way that we will really know his power, his grace, his renewal, and his sufficiency. That's the only way we'll know that eternal and very heavy significance for which we were destined. When we're afflicted, then he will keep us from being crushed. When we are perplexed, then he will keep us from despair. When we are persecuted, then he will manifest his presence in us to keep us aware that we are not alone. When we're struck down, then we'll know the feel of his protection, his uplift, his resurrection, his renewal. There's nothing to do in this chapter. Isn't that cool? It's kind of like the sermon this morning. Nothing to do, but just receive it. But if there's anything that might be implied to do, it's in the very last verse. Therefore, we look not at the things that are seen, but we look at the things that are unseen. And this chapter is calling us to look at life a different way, a way that is radically hopeful. Look, is there stuff in the news that just freaks you out? I know there is, whether it's international news or national news. Are there things on the horizon coming down the pike in world history that really have you very concerned? Are you tired? Are you exhausted? Are you afraid? This passage is radically hopeful and so welcome. It calls us to look at all of life, even things like cancer and unemployment and birth defects and back pain and low-level persecution and as we heard this morning in our adult class from John Stevenson, even getting burned at the stake, we can still remain radically hopeful and Godwardly optimistic. We are being renewed even now. All things are being renewed by the one who said, Behold, I make all things new. Our lives will prove to be those who believe in Jesus Christ, not like chaff, not trivial, but our lives will prove to be heavy lives, significant lives, glorious lives, the eternal weight of glory, which even now shines out of our weakness and the cracks in our cracked pots. Let's pray together. We ask now, our Father in heaven, that you would preside over 
these next moments and that you would use these moments to glorify yourself. And we pray that tomorrow, as we go out into the world, that we would not be so concerned with hiding our own flaws and failings, but even boast in those things so that the power of Jesus Christ might be manifest and God be glorified. Lord, use this now, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. John Homus is going to come and uh, put some questions to the candidate. George, if you would come forward. As you take these vows, knowing that you are weak and sinful, a cracked pot, take them humbly and at the same time boldly because God commits his grace to you as his son. His promises are for you and he has chosen you to be in his family. Do you believe the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments as originally given to be the inerrant word of God, the only infallible rule of faith and practice? I do. Do you sincerely receive and adopt the confession of faith and the catechisms of this church as containing the system of doctrine taught in the Holy Scriptures? And do you further promise that if at any time you find yourself out of accord with any of the fundamentals of this system of doctrine, you will on your own initiative make known to your presbytery the change which has taken place in your views since the assumption of this ordination vow. I will. I do. Amen. It's a long one. Do you approve of the form of government and discipline of the Presbyterian Church in America in conformity with the general principles of biblical polity? I do. Do you promise subjection to your brethren in the Lord? I do. Have you been induced as far as you know in your own heart? to seek the office of the holy ministry from love to God and a sincere desire to promote his glory in the gospel of his son. Yes. Do you promise to be zealous and faithful in maintaining the truths of the gospel and the purity and peace and unity of the church, whatever persecution or opposition may arise unto you on that account? I do. Do you engage to be faithful and diligent in the exercise of all your duties as a Christian and a minister of the gospel whether personal or relational, private or public, and to endeavor by the grace of God to endure in the profession of the gospel in your manner of life and to walk with exemplary piety before the flock of which God shall make you overseer. Yes. Are you now willing to take charge of this church agreeable to your declaration when accepting their call? And do you rely upon God for strength, promise to discharge to it the duties of a pastor? Amen. Mr. Charles Kelsey is going to come forward and ask you some questions now, congregation. Now I ask the members of St. Andrew's Park Road Presbyterian Church these questions. If willing, please respond with, we do. Do you, the people of this congregation, continue to profess your readiness to receive George Sayer, whom you have called to be your pastor? We do. Do you promise to receive the word of truth from his mouth with meekness and love and to submit to him in the due exercise of discipline? We do. do you promise to encourage him in his labors and to assist his endeavors for your instruction and spiritual edification? We do. do you engage to continue to him while he is your pastor that competent worldly maintenance which you have promised and to furnish him with whatever you may see needful for the honor of religion and for his comfort among you. Can I ask the ordinand to come up? And uh, with all the commissioners, please come forward now for the laying on of hands. George, if you could kneel right here. We're going to put this Geneva robe on George as a uh, symbolic of his investiture for office. Let's pray together now. Our Father in heaven, we have prayed the Lord of the harvest to send forth laborers into his field and you have answered lavishly. We come before Jesus Christ, the head of the church, who has plundered the world and given good gifts to men. 
And we thank you for this gift that George is to us. We thank you for all that you have done to prepare our brother. We praise and thank you for his family of origin, his parents, his grandparents, who have been a godly example to him. We thank you, our Father, for Susan, his beloved. We thank you for Adam and Ariel and Asher. We pray your blessing upon them as a family. And we now follow your lead. You are the ordainer, and we simply recognize your move. And so we set aside George Sayor. We set him apart for the sacred ministry of word and sacrament. And we ask, Lord Jesus Christ, go with him and lead him. We ask, Holy Spirit, fall upon him and empower him for what lies ahead. And our Father, we pray that he would know your embrace as you use him. Help this congregation to encourage and welcome his ministry. Work out your will in him and through him. We commend him to God and to the word of his grace. In the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit, amen. We'll now offer George the right hand of fellowship. You can stand. Stay up here, George. I now pronounce and declare that George Sayor has been regularly elected, ordained, and installed a pastor in this congregation, agreeable to the word of God and according to the Constitution of the Presbyterian Church in America, and that as such, he is entitled to all support, encouragement, honor, and obedience in the Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. You can be seated. George, thank you for the honor of giving you the charge and participating in this wonderful service. Ordination is a beginning, beginning of a new life, beginning of a new ministry. But I want you for a minute to go forward in time with me to the time when you will end this ministry. And I want you to keep the day of your death in mind as you live your life. I find that the older I get, when there are more, clearly more yesterdays than tomorrows, you begin to become mindful of this great gospel ministry of ours and how we are passing on the baton to faithful men who are apt to teach. And you give me great comfort as I increasingly look to the day of my ending. So I want to share with you thoughts that I think will be meaningful to help you to focus on what it will be like to triumph in that day when your ministry, too, draws to conclusion after you, too, have laid your hands on young men who will come after you because the most urgent work in the world is the preservation of the gospel. And we are entrusted with heavenly treasure. And so I want to look to what Paul says at the end of 2 Timothy, shortly before he's taken out on the Ostian Way and shortly before he pays the martyr's price. He writes to Timothy, his mentor and legate in Ephesus. And he says to him, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. And here is your charge, three words. Preach the word. 
Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you, be watchful. In all things, endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. And Paul says, for I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. And then he says these words that I want you to say in that day. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. Do you hear that? I have finished. That's cruciform, as Pastor said. He's come to the end of his days, and he too can say, I have finished the race, and I have kept the faith. There is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but to all those who have loved his appearing. Your charge was the charge given to me by godly men who are now with the Lord. That was my charge, preach the word. The only effective means of transformation in this world is the word of God entrusted to you. Karakson Tanlagan, preach the word. The word is the word of God. Karakson, preach. The word kerakson, the non noun form of that verb is kerux, a herald. What is a herald? You know, I like Greek dramedy, comedy. Comedy always has a herald. A herald brings the euangelion, the good news. What is a herald? In this culture, the most famous herald of all was Pheidippides. You know that name? He was the legate of Miltiades after the Battle of Marathon. And he, he was commissioned to run 26 miles to Athens to tell them that Europe had been saved. And that faithful man ran to bring that good news pouring out his life as he ran, cheering everyone with his word as he ran. And finally, at the end of his course, he came into the Agora and shouted, Kyrie, Nikomen, rejoice, the battle is won. And then he died. That's the herald. And that's your message too, rejoice. Your, your ministry should be marked by joy, the joy of the gospel, because he has won the battle for us. And that message should go out to all the world. Kyrie, Nikoman, rejoice. He has won. And that's the herald. Karakson Tonlagan, as Paul said to Timothy, preach the world, word. George, preach with all your heart the word. And the day will come when you, like Jesus and like Paul, will be able to say, well, it is finished. Amen. My charge is now to everyone except George, <laughs> to the congregation, to you folks. And and it's taken from Hebrews chapter 13, where the writer says, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. George has become, has already been one of our leaders. Uh, we're recognizing him as such today. It's not that he's, he's coming in just from the beginning and now beginning to lead. 
He's been doing that. But now we're, we're ordaining him. We're recognizing the work of the Spirit. And we're choosing him and, and placing him and recognizing that among us. And that calls for us to, and you've already, this is easy because you've, you've already answered the question that, that you agree to submit yourselves to his teaching. And so this passage calls you to do that as he preaches the gospel, to believe the gospel, to obey and submit to that. But also notice, for they keep watch over your souls. And for George and other ordained leaders, your, your elders, to keep watch over your souls, first of all, yes, you've got to be here, but more than that, you have to be interacting with him and them. You see, they can't, they can't keep watch over your souls just if you come here on Sunday morning, sit and sort of nod through a sermon and, and then get up and leave. And so that means that you have to be part of the church family. For some of you, that means that you're going to be at, at George's, for you men, you're going to be at George's Wednesday night or Wednesday morning Bible study, you know, wiping the sleep out of our eyes. And, and for others, you're going to be interacting in, in those various small group ministries so that he and your leaders can, can keep watch over your souls. As those who will give an account, and then the passage goes on, let them do this with joy and not with grief, for this would be unprofitable for, and you almost expect to, to hear it say, for this would be an unprofitable for, for them, but no. This would be unprofitable for you. You see, He's here to keep watch over your soul. But that's a good thing for you. That means, that means that his job is to help you connect with the gospel and have that new life and, and have that continuing work of the gospel in your life. And so the next verse says, and that's as far as we're going to take it, but he says, so pray for us. For we are sure that we have a good conscience, desiring to conduct ourselves honorably in all things. And so I say, pray for George. Pray for your leaders. Because as you do that, as you do that, you're really praying for yourself and for your own growth in that good news. Amen. Well, I, I'm honored that you are all here. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, please receive the Lord's benediction now. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace, both now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.